hello and uh, welcome to number five in our series of talks on the religious and uh, cultural Armenian heritage. Tonight we're very pleased to be in the very distinguished company of linguist and armenologist Dr. Yasmin Trabut, whose talk tonight will be definitely endangered Armenian language as intangible cultural heritage of Artsakh. Just uh, for, for your information, everyone, this session is being recorded and will be made available on the Diocese of the Armenian Church in UK and Ireland uh, website. Um, we will hopefully have about 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the session um, for any questions you might wish to ask. Um, by way of a very brief introduction, uh, Yasmin Duntragut, uh, the head of the Center for the Study of Christian Islam and is uh, head of the Department of Armenian Studies at the University of Salzburg. She also holds an honorary doctorate in Armenian Studies from the Armenian Academy of Sciences. Dr. Yasmin's research focuses on ethnic Armenian identity and the Armenian National Church, the Armenian religious diaspora, and the tradition of Armenian monasteries and scriptoria. Amongst very many uh, grants and awards, Dr. Yasmin received the Knights of uh, Vartan grant in 2016 for her project, The Unknown Armenian Prisoners of War in Habsburg, Austria, 1915 to 1919, um, the Anthropological Studies of Rudolf Koch. In 2019, uh, Dr. Yasmin was the recipient of the prestigious uh, Aurora Madiganyan Medal in recognition of her uh, contribution to the study of Armenian culture and history. Uh, most recently, Dr. Yasmin was uh, awarded the Order of Tavush, the highest uh, ecclesiastical honor of the Armenian Apostolic Diocese of Tavush for her commitment and help during and after the 2020 war in Nazareth. Um, as I said, this is but a, a, a very, very brief resume of Dr. Yasmin Duntragut's huge body of work. Um, so I hope I've not done a disservice here. But, um, Dr. Yasmin, if I could hand over to you now, please. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and uh, hello and good evening from Austria, from a small village in the region of Upper Austria. I'm not sitting in Salzburg, I'm in, in a small village in my farm and I'm trying to give you uh, some uh, ideas about my uh, last research project on the sociolinguistics of the Armenian language in Karabakh, in Artsakh. And uh, so what you will hear today is partly um, research in progress or work in progress. So there are some things I can all already tell you, but a lot of work still has to be done. Actually, I will go to Amina next week and I will meet um, people, uh, refugees from Artsakh now staying in Armenia and I will talk with them about their linguistic behavior, about their languages, about their dialect and so on. And uh, then I hope uh, in autumn I will be able to publish the, the final analysis and my perhaps um, paper uh, also to to hand over to the Armenian uh, new government or old government, let's see what will happen, uh, because I'm also working in this part of the uh, government, the Ministry of uh, Education, Science, uh, Culture and Sports, and also at the Academy Institute uh, for linguistics, the Acharyan Institute of Linguistics, where we continue this work on, on uh, the dialect of Artsakh. So please uh, allow me now to share the screen and I will start my presentation. 
Mm. Wait, here we are. I hope you can see it. Is it okay? Okay. Well, uh, when I talk about Armenian language, it is more than just the dialect of Artsakh or the Karabakh dialect, as it is called. It's in general about language in, in Artsakh, about various uh, functions of the Armenian language in, in this region and uh, in um, Artsakh. So first of all, um, if we talk about language as cultural heritage, there's a few points I would like to mention. Language itself is, of course, intangible cultural heritage, but it's also a, a vehicle, a channel, a carrier, a transmitter of cultural heritage. Uh, you know how close, closely related language and culture are in general. Uh, it's very difficult to separate them from each other because in general, culture is depending uh, upon language and language is depending upon culture. So it's very difficult um, to separate them. Uh, both are also part of conventions of society because it's the society who gives you um, the language and you talk to the society and culture is the same, it's made of conventions. So language plays a really important role in society and it plays an important role in culture. And language and also culture are both very important for the ethnic identity of a people because it helps to construct the ethnic identity or the individual identity. It's very important, um, the language you learn as child, the language you learn later on. And this, of course, uh, influence your identity or your, your beliefs to be a member of an ethnic group or of a social group. Um, so we can also not view language and culture isolated. Both are embedded into a society, embedded into a certain environment. That's why they are always influenced by a lot of what we call external factors. We will talk about that later on. And thus language and culture are permanently subject to change. And because of these changes, of course, they are vulnerable. Before I start to talk about uh, the languages of Artsakh, please allow me to give me uh, a few minutes to give you some basic terms of sociolinguistics, because I, I will constantly use these terms and I would just like to, to give you a short introduction. So what I will basically talk about is the topic of language vitality and its assessment. What does it mean if I talk about language vitality? A language, when is a language called vital? Uh, if a language is used as mean of communication in various social contexts and for special and specific purposes. Uh, the most significant indicator of a language vitality is that the language is used at home daily use at home, regular use at home. So if I start to study the vitality of a language, I have to look at the functions a language has in this social context, in this social environment. And if I start to study this and I want to assess the language vitality, this means I would try to find out is a language vital enough to survive in future? So if I start to study now the, the language or the languages of Artsakh, this is all about, are they going to survive? Are they endangered or are they vital enough to survive perhaps what is coming up in this region? The main question I have to access language vitality is very simple, it's just, this long question, who speaks what language, to whom and when, 
and perhaps what about, so also the topic. This is perfectly true for societies in which more languages are spoken, like bilingual or multilingual societies, because especially in, in, in the area in, in Artsakh and in Armenia and in Azerbaijan, you know that we have this phenomenon of multilingualism or of more languages that have to be spoken or have to be learned by the people during your life. So by assessing language vitality, I look at the functions of a language, which are called in social linguistic terms domains, in which domains is language used in family, in friends, in work, in church, and so on. And how are the registers of the languages, which means which style of a language do I use? It's, it makes a difference. Do I talk to my father? Do I talk to a, a, a physician? Do I talk to the president? So this is called this different language. Uh, languages I use are called registers. And there's a difference between a high and low register. High means mostly written language. So standardized language very often and low means vernacular, the language I usually speak. So each of us has at least, if, if you are trained to read and write, at least two registers, everyone has more registers of one language. So for example, I speak German, but I speak usually at home, I speak German dialect, but of course I can read and write standard German. So I have the situation to, to write, I have to use the standard German. Of course, I can use dialect, but depending on the situation. Then of course, I have to look at the acquisition of language. Uh, and here's very central, the transmission across the generation of the language. Then what are the motivations to use the languages? So what about the language prestige? Is the language prestigious? Is it modern? Is it fashionable? And about the attitudes. Attitudes, language attitudes means the feelings you have towards a language. Are you proud of your language? Do you like your language? Do, for example, do you like the sound of the language? Or Perhaps you do not like the speakers of, or people who use the language. So perhaps that's why the attitude towards the other language is also not uh, so good. Then of course, very important, especially in, in our field is what about language policy? So the government policy regarding language use. And of course, are there any distinctive niches, which means particular context where this language is used, for example, church language, no, uh, uh, liturgical language. This is, for example, something very specific. And all these factors together uh, give an idea about the vitality of a language. So measuring vitality is something extremely difficult. There are various methods in, in measuring this vitality and the, the degrees of endangerment. So there are various methods. The most used one and the most famous one is the UNESCO method. But unfortunately, UNESCO has ceded to uh, engage in endangered languages. So it's, it's about four or five years ago, they stopped in working on endangered languages. Um, but that's really a pity, but they gave over this program to Ethnolog and to other organizations who care now for the so-called endangered languages. Uh, but still the degrees are, are kept. You see these degrees of endangerment and they mostly depend on the intergenerational language transmission, which means um, do I uh, teach my children my own mother tongue. So is it really uh, to be considered a mother tongue? Is it used at home to my children learn this language naturally or do they only learn it in school? So this is a very important uh, factor to measure language vitality. I will talk about this later on. Okay, let's turn to our languages of Artsakh. 
Uh, you see here a very famous map of uh, famous Raja Ajaryan of, from the beginning of the 20th century. And um, you can see he, uh, his uh, child to, uh, to give a map of the Armenian dialects. And what is most interesting for us now is that the so-called Karabakh dialect here in dark green is one of the most spoken Armenian dialects, especially at that time. And uh, if we go back to the time he made this uh, dialectal map, so that's the time of the Russian empire. And it's more or less uh, the Elizabeth Bull governorate that you see here, plus, uh, main parts of, of uh, later Republic of Azerbaijan up to Dagestan and, and uh, Northern Caucasus. But it's even spoken in, in regions of Iran and even quite far to the, to the south. Um, this was about 100 years ago. So we'll, we have this status, so we know about 100 years ago, he did this map, this was the status of the length of the Karabakh dialect about 100 years ago, or more than 100 years ago, and uh, what we have to see now, how is the status now. Uh, Talking about Armenian language in Azar in general, we have to start with uh, what sources do we have about Armenian language in general? So the, the oldest sources we, we have uh, that mention that a language uh, called Armenian is spoken in that area is uh, of course the geography of Strabon from the first century before Christ and, and uh, uh, in our uh, time and he was writing about that Armenian was spoken in a very large area even up to the Kura river and that's quite important because as, as you know the Kura river is always uh, mentioned as the main border between um, Armenian population and later on the so-called Caucasian Albanian population so that's quite interesting but we know also that the language played a, a very important role in the Christianization of uh, both Artsakh, Utik, and later Albania, especially uh, in, in the first centuries uh, with the Armenian schools and when the, the written variety of Armenian, so classical Armenian, was spread in this area. Uh, another uh, quite early uh, source about uh, a, a dialect in Artsakh is Stepanos Sunetsi, the metropolitan of Sunit, who um, wrote an own uh, commentary on grammar of Dionysius Vax. And he, he was the first one to describe Armenian dialects. And he mentioned a dialect spoken, an Armenian dialect spoken in Artsakh, and uh, gave a short description about the Armenian dialect. Uh, that Armenian was present in this uh, geographical territory is clear because during the medieval time, we had a lot of inscription, we had a lot of sources having been written in Armenian language, in classical Armenian, later on, even in medieval Armenian, we had a lot of scriptoria. So proof enough that Armenian was spoken and written in Artsakh. The development of the dialect itself, which was later called Karabakh dialect, there are several um, approaches. So mainly the dialect might have developed in, in the later medieval times. Um, Chahokyan had another approach than Acharyan. Chahokyan thought even that some of the features, the typical sound features of the dialect appear earlier than the 12th century. But of course, a lot of features came because of intensive language contact, especially with Iranian languages later on, also, also with Turkic languages, and of course, also with Russian. But as I told you, the Karabakh dialect is one of the, the mostly spoken dialects in the Armenian uh, world. If we go now to this uh, back in, in history and look at this time, uh, Acharyan described the 
the uh, Karabakh dialect. We have to say at that time, of course, um, after the, a long period in the Persian Empire, the whole region was incorporated into the Russian Tsarist Empire. And from that time, especially from the second half of the 19th century, we, we already have a lot of information about the population there, about the languages that were spoken there. And we know that it, it was a multilingual um, territory that uh, several ethnic groups were living uh, side by side and they were exchanging their languages, they were exchanging their cultures. So quite important uh, after the creation of the Elizabethbo governorate are of course the censuses we have because all of the censuses the, the Russian state in the, at the end of the 19th century and then in the beginning of the 20th century are all based on native language. So they, they based ethnicity or ethnic belonging on the native language. And that's quite important. So um, if we, for example, uh, look at this table here, um, then you can see that from the Camerol census in the 70s, uh, it's quite interesting that in the whole region here, uh, the, the most spoken language was Tatar, which is the old word for uh, the later uh, Azerbaijani language. So at that time, the people used to call the language Tatar or Caucasian Tatar even. So you see about two thirds of the population spoke uh, Azerbaijani as their mother tongue and about one third spoke Armenian in the whole region of Elizabeth Bowl. So this is of course bigger than the, the region of Artsakh. In the Russian census then uh, a few decades later, you see that there are not so many changes. Uh, also the population was growing because Elizabeth Bowl was one of the most populated areas and most populated Caucasian provinces. Uh, but also uh, what is quite important, you had as let's say as languages that were spoken there for a long time, Armenian, um, Caucasian language like Lesgian or other Caucasian languages and of course, Turkic languages like Azerbaijani, uh, Russian came into this um, territory and starting from the 19th century, Russian gained in importance because it became of course, uh, it was the language of the empire. So it was the official language of the empire. And of course, through schools, um, it became a very prestigious language and it became uh, gradually the language of education, especially not so much in, in uh, governorate of Elizabeth Bull, but very much in, in Baku, in the neighboring governorate. And you know that Baku was one of the centers of Russian speaking population, both of uh, Tatar origin and Armenian origin. With the Sovietization of this region, the power of Russian was even more growing because of the uh, Russification policy of, of uh, Soviet times. Uh, first of all, there was this nativization here, which affected even uh, uh, the new newly created autonomous region of Gorno karabakh but it affected uh, especially during Stalin's period uh, that Russian became mandatory in all non-Russian schools and that people gradually grew up learning Russian and using Russian and that's why Russian became gradually even their second language or for some of them even their first language or their mother tongue. Uh, so Russian uh, in the 20th century, especially after the 30s, uh, Russian, um, the importance of, of Russian was gradually growing and also the use of Russian was growing and uh, the percentage of bilingual Armenians of bilingual Karabakh Armenians. Um, with the, with the changes after uh, the first Karabakh war, uh, there was um, 
the so-called armenization of the region. So of course it was quite important to strengthen the position of Armenian. So Armenian became the official state language of uh, the Republic of Artsakh and was a fully functional languages. So with all um, written, with all the official use and the Karabakh dialects were freely used as well as Armenian vernacular. So we have dialect speakers, we have vernacular speakers and um, literary Armenian, standard Armenian was used as written form in public, in schools and wherever. So the linguistic landscape changed, of course. Russian is still or, or was still functioning as language of, as we call it, as lingua franca, uh, to use it with other people, or it had some functions uh, in schools, in, in education, uh, in, in several discourses, commercial discourses. It had also a symbolic dimension for the internationalization of this region together, of course, then starting from the new millennia with English. So Russian is more or less, or was more or less the unofficial second language of Artsakh. And as you know now, there is this banding uh, decision if Russian should not become the second official language of Artsakh in future. What has completely been removed from the linguistic landscape of Artsakh uh, is Azerbaijani. So it's still used by some elderly speakers by some Armenians who learned it in their youth, but it's not really uh, to, to be found, or it was not to be found in the linguistic landscapes, which means on science and, and so on. But in general, we had something like a situation, people used standard Armenian for some functions, they used their Karabakh dialect, mainly for, for their family talks, for friends talks, perhaps even for work, and they used Russian. And this is what the census reflects. You can see that uh, most of the inhabitants used Armenian language, um, and but also many of these Armenians uh, were quite fluent in Russian. Um, so yeah, this is what I just said. Uh, the kind of languages we had in the territories and we have still now, we have the dialects, we have vernacular Armenian, we have standard Armenian, we have Russian, uh, we have traces of Azerbaijani now, uh, but still it is now, of course, the only official language of Azerbaijan. And we have some other languages which are, are not influencing the, the region. Uh, if you give me some time, I will show you another um, material which is quite interesting from my research work on Armenian prisoners of war in, in, in Austria, because among these prisoners of war, there were some Karabakh Armenians and I've just analyzed their data now. So uh, these Armenians, they were studied by an Austrian anthropologist during World War I, and there were kind of racial surveys, uh, which is of course not uh, very uh, nice to say, but anyhow, the material he left us, so he left us the material of about 7,000 Russian prisoners of war, among them about 200 Armenians, and he left us a lot of material, photographs, anthropometric data, clinical data, biographic data, phonograms, we have phonograms, we have photographs, we have plasticers. And among these Armenians uh, from various uh, regions, we do have uh, 38 Armenian prisoners of war from the region of historical Artsakh and Utik, and 27 uh, prisoners of war who were born in places who belonged to the territory of the Republic of Artsakh. Um, so you can see here, they, they came from all the regions of the former governorate of Elizabeth Paul. And I would just like to introduce you some of these people because this is a really rare opportunity to have, to, uh, to have material about language use, uh, which was more than 100 years ago. 
so this Austrian anthropologist, he interviewed these prisoners of war about their lives, about their lives in the villages, about their languages, about their religion and so on. So what you can see here was quite interesting also to the Austrians, because if you see the, the archival uh, comments, they were so much surprised that such a, a, a kind of multilingualism was spread among the Armenians here in this territory. And uh, as a matter of fact, you can see that there's among these 27, there was only one person who was monolingual, who just knew Armenian. But most of them uh, even knew more than two languages. Most of them knew three languages. And there were three people even knowing five languages. One of them I can show you here. This is Nerses from Tahasel, from Hajut region, who uh, told about his life story and about the languages he knew and how he knew the languages. And this is quite amazing because they were asked for their competences. How well do you know the languages? When do you use the languages? And what about your writing and reading competences? And this was quite interesting because it came out that a lot of people thought they knew how to speak many languages, like of course, Armenian as their mother tongue, as their native language. But most of them spoke Russian because they had to learn Russian in schools. Many spoke Azerbaijani, as you see, some spoke Persian depending where they lived in, in Artsakh, in Elizabeth. There was one speaking Turkmenic and there were some other people also speaking or knowing some other languages, depending uh, upon their professions. But you can see that they had interesting competences even in reading and writing. So let's have a look at, at some of, of, we have four uh, prisoners of war only from one village of Tovshan Lu. Uh, interesting enough, they, it seems they were friends, all of them were 20 years old, all of them were not married and all were raised uh, and born in, in the small village of Tovshan Lu, um, which used to be an Armenian village according to the uh, material, and all of them knew Armenian and, uh, and just Musa, this is Musa, a shepherd, he didn't know Russian because he didn't have to learn Russian being a shepherd, but all the others, they went to school and they had some Russian and uh, Isaac, this is Isaac, uh, he also knew how to read and write Armenian quite well. Then we have others from the very northern region, so uh, what is also called Northern Artsakh, from the famous village of Banans. You know, this is a very famous village, which also used to be an Armenian village. And we have here also four guys, as, you, as I have to say, uh, also knowing many languages. And even two of them uh, knew how to write even the new, and this is really amazing, they knew how to write Tatar because Azerbaijanian was written at that time in Arabic script. So that's really amazing. And one of them, Haikas, uh, uh, he even told us about uh, how he knew the languages and Han Bartun, who was a painter, he even knew German, which was quite amazing uh, because he told uh, us that he, in, in his uh, archival document, he were telling about that he was, uh, he was uh, working in the German villages of Helenendorf, and there he, he learned German from the farmers. And the most interesting facts we have from Nucha, which is more or less Caucasian Albanian territory, and with three people from this territory. Uh, this is Levon from Chalut. He was one of the most clever guy. He was a merchant. That's why he knew a lot of languages and he was very trained in, in languages. We have Badra Khan from Dashbulak, also knowing Armenian and Russian. Both of these villages were mainly Russian, or uh, sorry, mostly Armenian Russian. But, and that's quite interesting, we have an Armenian guy from Nish, which is a typical Udi village, village with Udi majority. And this guy, he knew Armenian, Russian, Persian, and 
Azerbaijan, and he knew to, to write and to read all four of these languages. And he said something that he also knew a Caucasian language a bit, but it's not clear if, it, if this Caucasian language was Udi or Georgian. So this was just a kind of, of very small case study. What is quite important for the future of Armenian languages there is the language policy of Azerbaijan, clear. So what I try to give you is a, is a very short overview of what happened in Azerbaijan. First of all, Azerbaijan was looking only on its own language because it had a lot of problem uh, to go back from uh, uh, Cyrillic script to Latin script and to have um, its language called Azerbaijani because even very long till the beginning of the new Republic of Azerbaijan, the post-Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan, the official language of Azerbaijan was not called Azerbaijani, but Turkish, which is quite amazing. And it was Haider Aliyev, who was the first one who succeeded in calling the state language of Azerbaijan, Azerbaijani. And this was just in the, in the constitution, in the first amendment of the constitution of the new Republic of Azerbaijan, which is amazing. And it took them several years to go back to Latin script. So they had a lot of fight for their own language, which is really quite interesting. But of course, the status of Azerbaijani is the language, it's the official language of Azerbaijan and it's the only official language of Azerbaijan. And with the language policy, this language has to be used in all functions, in all spheres. So the constitution gives the right to every person, every citizen of Azerbaijan to use uh, his or her native language. This doesn't mean that there is no language repression in Azerbaijan. Uh, we have a, a law on state language, as you can see, I, I listed it here, which is very strict and which also affects the place names. Uh, Azerbaijan has very quickly started to replace the Armenian place names now, especially in Hartrud region. Uh, this is very important for them. And of course, uh, in the law of education, which was also amended several times, it's quite important that Azerbaijani is used in all the schools and even in those few schools which are uh, characterized as minority schools where Russian is the, the language of instruction or Georgian, uh, Azerbaijani has to be taught along uh, language, history, literature, and Azerbaijani is still Compuls, uh, compulsory for uh, universities. If you talk about minority language status in Azerbaijan, this is in general not existing. Why? Because we do not have a minority law in, in Azerbaijan. Until now, Azerbaijan does not have a, a, a comprehensive minority law. So it's quite difficult to speak about the situation of minority languages. So Azerbaijan has done a lot to show, so to say, that it's, it's ready to accept minority languages. And it signed a lot of very prominent and very important uh, international covenants, conventions and charters. Among them, the most important charter in the European Union and for the European Council, the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages. And I have to say, they signed it, but they never ratified it and they never implemented it. And that's quite much discussed in European Council now, also in European Union. So that uh, what will happen if Azerbaijan signed it, but they don't keep it. So they don't keep to the law or the, the conventions they signed. And following Ethnologue, which is uh, the successor of UNESCO Endangered Languages, of course, it's clear Azerbaijan is national language, Russian is language of wider communication, Talish, Georgian and Lesbian are more or less, let's say, accepted as educational minority languages, but all the other languages, and we do not even know how many languages they 
exist in, in Azerbaijan. They are just, yeah, they are just spoken. And they are not cared for. This is, of course, also true for Armenian. And if you just look at a statement Haida Aliyev gave about this European charter, it says everything. It's, it's here in green. And uh, this is the late uh, last statement of the Framework Convention of the N uh, National Minorities, which was published uh, last year. Uh, and you can see that even uh, in the European Union and the European Council, we know about the problems with uh, minority languages and minority situation in Azerbaijan regarding languages, not speaking about the religious status. This is in general more about languages. So coming to the question, is Armenian language endangered in the situation it is now or in future? First of all, let's look at this more or less actual map where Karabakh dialect is spoken, actually. And, and you can see it's the, the main region is still what is now called Artsakh. And in the occupied territory, uh, it's spoken together with other dialects. And of course, it's clear as, as with all other parts of the cultural heritage of the Armenians in uh, Artsakh, that it's mainly in these former occupied territories, as they call it internationally, that also the language, the Armenian language and the various varieties of Armenian language are endangered. So if you look at what, what is the history, so you can see if you, you try to look at the various periods we have, um, what was used as formal language, as official language during the, the empires or the states, um, what was used at home, um, what was used as language of um, inner ethnic, inter ethnic communication, you can see that this changed. And uh, what is the most important is, of course, here, because this is what is open now. So you can see what we had in, in the Atar Republic uh, before war, when these, this situation uh, we had that uh, standard Armenian uh, was fully functionally used and taught in, in schools and, and universities and was language of instruction too. Um, and uh, Russian was still used, but vernacular Armenian and of course the Karabakh dialect was very uh, often used and it was even very prestigious uh, in, in the society. And this situation may be kept in, in this part which is now called Artsakh. Yeah? This is possible. It might change uh, again towards Russian, if Russian becomes the official, the second official language. And we do not know so far what will be the role of Azerbaijani in this region. But in the other territories, um, of course, let's say the danger that Azerbaijani becomes strong again and Russian becomes strong, especially as formal language, as official language, and will then remove uh, the role of standard Armenian, this danger is quite high. So again, uh, we had here a hundred years ago, it was a multilingual society, but the, the mother tongue was the Karabakh dialect and a few people learned to, to write and read Armenian and other languages. This changed during Soviet period where the literacy in Armenian was growing, but also the knowledge in Russian. And a lot of people became slowly real bilingual speakers of Armenian and Russian. This changed again after, uh, in the post-Soviet time, so in the, in the time of the Republic of Artsakh, when the dialect was very often spoken and Armenian was 
quite normally spoken in the whole territory and Russian lost is its importance a little bit. You know, the same situation as in Armenia where Russian also lost uh, its importance and the competences in Russian are worse than they used to be during Soviet time. And of course, Azerbaijani was not spoken any longer. And there might be this change as you, as you can see here that Armenian, uh, the dialect might be kept in the territory of Artsakh. It might be kept in the other territories, but it's it's very difficult to be kept there, especially if not as many people go back to the territories or will live in the territories there. Um, Armenian will, of course, I hope will still be taught uh, and will still be language of instruction in Artsakh. In the other territories, it's, it's questionable if Armenian will still be uh, language of instruction or it will be possible uh, to teach Armenian and of course um, the importance of Russian and of course also of Azerbaijani will rise again. As the Armenians say, Usats Trusats, Azerbaijani will have another role again. So <laughs> if I try to put this all together, um, talking about the Karabakh dialect, uh, what is important, I don't think uh, it's vulnerable. It's it's now at the moment it's safe, but it's vulnerable. And in the territories outside of this Artsakh, um, it is endangered. Um, still, if people use it at home and if people continue to speak their dialect, it's not so much in danger. So Karabakh dialect or the use or the future of the Karabakh dialect depends on the people themselves. Yeah? Because if they continue to, to use this dialect or vernacular Armenian at home as their family language, and they transmit this language to their children, this dialect will survive. It's a little bit different the situation for standard Armenian, for written Armenian. Uh, so this is much more in danger, and I would even call standard Armenian, written Armenian, definitely in danger because we do not know what is the language policy of, of Azerbaijan regarding the education, regarding the public function, the formal functions of standard Armenian in future. We do not know it, and we do even not know, will people also transmit standard Armenian to their kids? So we do not know. And of course, the effect of Russian. Russian will have uh, a, a more important role, as I told you, especially as vehicular, as lingua franca, with the others, also with the Azerbaijanians. It will be, again, the prestigious language and the language of education work in business. And it will, again, be a, a very good opportunity if you learn Russian or if you know Russian well to find a job in Russia if you want to emigrate. But in general, Russian and uh, standard Armenian depend as much from the Azerbaijanian language policy uh, as from the Armenian language policy. And the Armenian language policy, which means the Armenian government, uh, must also think about the effects of Russian on the Armenian language and how to, uh, to make understandable that the most important for a language, for a dialect to survive, is that it's used. The dialect must be used, it must be used at home, it must be uh, spoken with various generations or transmitted to the children. It makes no sense not to speak a, a, a language at home, but to teach it in school, for example. This is what we have for a lot of European minority languages that people do not speak it at home, but they teach it in school. Like one of the languages I used in my own family. I've never learned it at home, but I learned it then later on at university. Um, well, and of course, what is also quite important is what can, we linguists, we scholars too, to help 
both the Karabakh dialect, but in general, Armenian language to survive, to stay vital in Artakh and the other territories. And what can the international monitoring, which means um, European Council, uh, European Union and others to also to, to have some pressure on the language and minority legislation in, in Azerbaijan, because this is uh, quite important because as a matter of fact, you know that um, Western Armenian is considered as and well, definitely endangered language in Turkey and in, in the Middle East. And a lot of pressure was given from the European Council and the European Union, especially on Turkey and Middle Eastern countries uh, to, uh, to have a look and to care for Western Armenian. And I think if we try, if we scholars try now to, to, uh, to speak about that there is a danger of having this Eastern Armenian dialect, this so important dialect of Karabakh uh, is endangered and Armenian in general is endangered in this region. I think uh, this would also be possible to have it internationally accepted. Well, yeah, and that's the convention, one of the most important conventions Azerbaijan has also signed, but you see here uh, the Convention for the Safeguarding of Indangible Cultural Heritage Language as a Vehicle of the Indangible Cultural Heritage is accepted. And accepting and signing this convention means you have to safeguard this intangible cultural heritage of the minorities. So signed by Azerbaijan, but never implemented and never ratified. Thank you. Well, <laughs> uh, I think that was a lot of information and uh, a lot of also linguistic uh, information. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Yasmin. You, that, that was absolutely fascinating. You, I feel that you've opened the door to so many issues that we, a lay person like me, would never have come across. And uh, it, it was really enlightening talk, so thank you. And, and you, you, introduced, you introduced us to Nerses, age 23, who was a bricklayer who spoke yeah. different languages. And, yeah. and, and you've done something for his memory and the memory of people who, who were with him, who were POWs with him. And, and especially uh, touching, because we live in England and to be bilingual in England is, is to be safe. Yes. <laughs> um, to speak five languages is, is amazing. So um, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, can I ask all our participants if, if uh, they have any questions they would like to ask Dr. Yasmin, please um, raise your hands or uh, send a, a, a message to me. Can't see anyone. Is there anybody? I'm sure there must be lots of questions. Trying to see if anyone's got their hands raised. Well, oh, you are mute. You are mute. <laughs> Yes. I can't hear you. Um. <laughs> Sonia. <laughs> um yeah, perhaps I I I I would I'd answer this uh, first question of Sonia. Uh, what led me to study Armenian language? Uh, this is quite difficult uh, to explain. So um, 
first of all, I'm a linguist and I, I was in Russian studies and in Indo-European studies. And during my Indo-European studies, I come across uh, classical Armenian and I learned classical Armenian. And I was extremely impressed by this language. And it was extremely interesting to me that it was an Indo-European language not being Indo-European and at all the structure, it was somehow different. And so I, I was quite interested. And it was then by chance that my, uh, my professor of linguistics asked me to, to write my MA thesis on multilingualism or on bilingualism, since I come from a multilingual, multi-ethnic background. And I told him, yes, no problem, but I, I would like to do that in Soviet Union. <laughs> I said, okay. And I said, okay, so uh, let's, let's write something about Russian and the impact of Russian on the so-called national languages of the, of the Soviet republics. And I said, but which language do you like to, to uh, write? Uh, about and where do you want to go? I said, yeah, I, I've been to Russia several times. So I think um, one of the Christians or publics and I thought perhaps Georgia or uh, uh, Armenia, but I would like to go to Armenia because I already know classical Armenian and because I'm quite interested in the culture and yeah. And he said, okay, uh, I will help you. And half a year later, I got a, a very special um, grant to go, uh, Soviet grant to go to, to Armenia, and I entered Armenia in 8080, in February 8080, exactly when the Karabakh movement started, <laughs> and uh, uh, stayed then in uh, Armenia for about uh, one and a half, two years, and learned Armenian and so on. So it was really the linguistic interest in, in this language uh, and of course the, my interest in everything. If, if I talk about language, which means if you study a language, you have to study the culture, you have to study the history. And of course, being uh, also interested in religion, uh, in religious studies, I said, that's, that's perfect. This is, this is really everything together. <laughs> so that's, that's the, was the beginning of my, my interest in Armenian studies, so more than 30 years ago. <laughs> Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my, my, my question was, um, you, you mentioned that um, Azerbaijan had been uh, very uh, quick to change place names. Um, yes. Uh, Hadrut and Sushi being um, two examples. Um, do, do you think that that is, um, it's, that is because they know that if they change the language, they will start to alienate uh, yes. Start to deracinate people. Do you think it's that 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 they understand that, or do you think it's be, that it's because of a land grab that they're changing the name? Of course, they have. First of all, they have the law. They have two laws regarding place names and territory names. But uh, if if even before uh, the ceasefire agreement, they did it. <laughs> so just looking in the internet. You saw, saw that on Wikipedia, whatever you look, that they were immediately changing the place names. Yeah, this was really extremely quick. And this is, of course, a way uh, um, to tell people, okay, that's ours. So again, the, the question of uh, the falsification of history or distortion of history. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, for them, it's, it's extremely important that the place names, are, even if they, the, some of the place names are still the Armenian place names, but written in, in, uh, in Latin as a, as a Bajanian script. Uh, but uh, for them, it's extremely important. Um, and I think that's also a way to, as you say, to alienate people, to tell them, okay, we are now. Yeah. To, so to say, the emperors here. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and that's, of course, very, yeah, it's very difficult. And, and uh, you know, you, you had a lot of, of these place name changes. 
uh, in the history here. And that's very difficult. So it's, it's especially the village names, because I had this problem, for example, with my, my study of this person as of war, that um, First of all, their names were extremely uh, corrupt because they wrote it down as they heard it, the Austrians. But the, 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 village, the names of the villages, they changed so often that it was so difficult to find the, which village they were really born in because of these name changes. So for some villages, they, the, the names remain, but some of the villages, they changed their names three, four times at least. And so I had to go back to the Russian archives to see in, in Elizabeth Bull time, what was the name of the village at that time? Yeah, it, it was not so, so easy. <coughs> and several of the villages I even couldn't find. I just found out that, that these villages perhaps do not exist anymore mm. as places. So perhaps after war, they were just, I mean, first world war, second world, they were just destroyed or people left. Because you know you have very tiny villages in this region, even in Sunik, where I have a lot of of, uh, uh, of of these prisoners of war in Sunik, there were tiny villages with with uh, ten up to twenty inhabitants, twenty five inhabitants. So um, of course that's quite difficult. So. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Anybody? I feel that I'm. I'm uh... I'm talking as usual quite a lot. <laughs> I, I would have a question if I may. Yes, of course, please. Jasmine, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. I enjoyed thank it you. very much. Thank you. Um, you were talking um, about the Republic of Artsakh, but also um, of the um, so-called liberated regions. And I was wondering, and the situation must be different in those two parts. Yes. I mean, in the Republic of Artsakh, you would expect, okay, the dialects um, continue to be spoken. Um, but in this liberated uh, regions, do you have any data um, how many Armenian people are still there and how their situation is? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I, I think it's... It, depends very much on the presence of Armenians there. Uh, yeah. if, if there should be any chance of keeping this dialect alive there, there must yeah. be speakers. Uh, yeah, absolutely true. So that's that's what I say. First of all, people must live there and speak the language no? and continue to, to use the language. But especially in these territories, it's very difficult uh, to say how many people are still there, how many people have returned, how many people will return. And I'm not sure if Azerbaijan give, really wants to give the, the data. Just imagine how long ago was the last census in Azerbaijan. It's more than 10 years ago. It's, it was in 2009. <laughs> So the, the demographics of Azerbaijan has completely changed in, in the last years, 10 years. Yeah. So this would be quite interesting to see what, what they would say about how many people live there, but it's very difficult. What I, I can try to find out in talking now in, in Armenia to people, if they know something, because you know, they say, okay, we know in this village people uh, went back or uh, a lot of people left. So we know about a lot of people who said, okay, no, we, we won't go back anymore. We, we will stay in Armenia or we'll go, we'll go to another place. It's not, uh, it's too difficult for us to, to live there. And you can perhaps draw a parallel to the to uh, about 100 years ago, uh, to the time of the Armenian genocide, when it was also a kind of linguicide because uh, it was the people were killed and with the people, the, the Armenian dialects were killed. But several of these people brought their dialects, for example, to Armenia. And uh, interesting enough, there are several villages we have from Ottoman Empire, they came from Ottoman Empire and settled in Armenia as refugees from there, and they still keep their, their dialects. So we have uh, the Sassoon villages, where the Sassoonsi dialect is spoken. So hopefully, some of the, the uh, people who came from these territories of Artsakh 
perhaps they stay will stay in Armenia and perhaps perhaps they will keep their Karabakh dialects also using not only their dialect, with their dialect, their traditions, because this is the most important, because as I said, culture and traditions are very closely linked to language. And I, I also think it's, it's very important that all the scholars who work in linguistics or in ethnography studies, that they record as much as possible these people now even to keep these records for later time, because you never know. For example, I have records of prisoners of war of the year 1915, five phonograms. And one of these guys is talking in Armenian and in Tatar, in Azerbaijanian. It's wonderful, yeah? So by chance, but imagine 100 years later, there comes a linguist from Austria and looks at this material. But it's so important to record as much as possible, to talk to these people, to ask them about their language, about even what kind of terms they use in their language for agricultural stuff, whatever, or their traditions uh, regarding culture, religion, religious traditions, and so on. It's so important just to record them. And uh, I really hope that uh, we have, we will have something like uh, these villages, like we have the Sassoon villages or Mush villages, which we have in, in Armenia, where the people keep their, their uh, Sassoonsi uh, dances and, and uh, dialects, and they transmit it even to their children in these, I don't know how many generations. But yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Many, very many thanks, Dr. Yasmin. Dr. You're welcome. <laughs> for, for uh, enlightening us this evening. We're indebted to you and we're indebted to you for all the work that you do. And have done. Um, so thank you again. Thank um, you very much. And say good night to you. So thank you, good night to you and very much for your attention and good night to London from Austria. <laughs>